help me welcome our great leader, Chuck Missler. Well, we have a message for you, Chuck. We have a message that we want to give it to you in unison. So, put me in, coach. Okay. All right. As Jack Reacher's warned those guys, you asked for it. <laughs> okay. I'm really intrigued how Lewis has given a whole new meaning to alien encounters. <laughs> oh, boy. Needless to say, this is one of the most, ex we've done this, what, 10 years? There's no question about it that this audience is the most exciting one we've had. We feel more electricity, more atmosphere of commitment from all of you that I can ever remember. That's really exciting. That, that in itself is an incredible blessing to us because that's the fulfillment of a dream, a fulfillment of a dream. But let's uh, pick, try to pick up I'll overlap a little bit with some of the things I said, but we're going to go on a little different territory here. Um, the semantic map. We use terms around here. Uh, we obviously, end time scenario is pretty straightforward. Strategic trends, is enough. these are studies that we have. Many of our studies would be under these categories, right? And, and uh, so the end time scenario is a Berean kind of thing, right? And the uh, strategic trends is an Issachar kind of thing. Are you familiar with our peculiar jargon there? I, by now, I'm sure you are. And so, uh, Berean, of course, is motivated by the, uh, uh, our trademark verse for several decades uh, to be more like the, the uh, Bereans rather than the Thessalonians in that they receive the word with readiness of mind and then search the scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. And I always used to emphasize that second part through most of those decades. In recent uh, years, I've come to realize it's the first part that's the toughest, setting aside our presuppositions to really understand what the, let, the, let the text talk, and uh, blindfolding our prejudices. Many of the things that we study today, the real challenge is to get rid of the traditions behind it and understand what the text really says. And so, and of course, uh, Bob Cornuke's book on the temple being a, a classic example of that. But anyway, the. Uh, the real issue, though, is not only the Berean studies, which we obviously encourage, and the Issachar uh, pursuit of truth, what's really going on being a second part. But if you leave here tomorrow with just that, we failed. Because the Berean and the Issachar elements are intended to combine for in the koinonos, or the action thing. And that's, we, we argue that the koinonos the translation of both the studies of Berean and the insights of Issachar combine in action, where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. That's motivated by um, Exodus 20, verse 7, which is the third commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. And that we argue, and we can do that from the text, by the way, is that has nothing to do with vocabulary. You know, I know for most of my life, that's always been taught in church not to swear and those kinds of things. That's not what it's about at all. I'm not saying you should swear. That's not the point. What that's talking about is not vocabulary. It's talking about taking the name of the king. It's talking about ambassadorship. And you should not take the name of the king as an ambassador unless you have, unless you're competent and, and uh, faithful to that calling. And so that's when I like to ask people, how many of you are in the full-time ministry? Can I see a show of hands? Those of you that don't have your hands up, repent. <laughs> <laughs> but see, the coin those things should result, your weekend should result not just in understanding our end-time scenario better, and it shouldn't be just understanding some of the strategic trends. And to boy, right now, there's so many of them, we can't possibly even cover them all. But the real issue is to have that translate into tactical actions, tactical priorities. If you go home from here without having your personal priorities modified, we failed. We failed. That's really why we're all here. That's the real reason, whether you realize it or not, you signed up in the first place. 
And one of the exciting things about the KI environment here is you're now part of a family. I hope you're part of it. If you're not a member, I want you to repair that. It's very easy to do. What do I mean by that? Take a course? Well, I'll get into that here in a minute anyway. Let's, uh, and of course, that's really what we're doing. Just to summarize a few things that we've already talked about, but just to get the flavor of moving here, as we continue to move on, we see corruption everywhere, throughout the highest level of government. And I mean everywhere. We could spend a lot of time just listing them. It's astonishing who we've allowed to be put into power over us. In our entertainments, our entertainment industry, in our schools, and even in many of our churches, we've got corruption. Now, many of those in the corridors of power should be, in my opinion, incarcerated for treason. If I somehow was appointed... <laughs> If I was somehow appointed military governor of this country, the first thing I would do is put most of our con congressmen, senators, and other officials in trial for treason. And I mean that very sincerely. And uh, so legislators sign bills they haven't even read? That's astonishing that not only that it has happened, but they're proud of it. Executives who are allowed to ignore laws, right and left. Judges who reverse juries, I thought, that, I thought that's what juries were for. Amend laws and they indulge in social engineering, destroying our country. They're doing that from the, from the, the, the uh, bar. Leaders who fail to exhibit the most elementary ethical conduct. You know, that's one thing that made our country great in the early years was the concept of the curb and the original exchanges. My word is my bond. These were men that may not be saved, but they did have an ethic that you could trust them. I've seen many deals done on a napkin in a restaurant or on a handshake and millions of dollars at stake. And even when it proved unprofitable, they stuck with it because that, that was their ethic. A commitment's a commitment. That's an ethic that was very operative. I spent 30 years in the corporate boardrooms, but that was more than 30 years ago. And I realize today it's very different, but I can remember in those days the guys that I had the privilege of serving with on 12 different boards were those kinds of people. You could trust them. If they said it, give you a handshake, whatever, you could make on that. And that's the way it worked. And because the most precious thing they had was their reputation because it's a small community. And uh, that's, of course, a long time ago. So the entertainment industry celebrates every imaginable evil and attacks, deliberately attacks family values. The very values that God has established for our welfare. There's a systematic attack with the same sex issues, whether it's the sanctity of the marriage in the first place, and so for the entertainment industry goes out of its way to, to attack. It deliberately dumbs down, and the, the educational establishment deliberately dumbs down our youth. I used to think the fact that we spend more for every student hour every year and the results get worse, I used to think that was just bad management. That's because I hadn't done my homework. There are many books that have been written to point out that's the intended result. And I remember when David Brees put his book, The Seven Men Who Rule the World from Their Graves, one of those being, being John Dewey. And part of the dynamic was there was a deliberate goal to dumb down the electorate to make them more pliable, more controllable. And I never realized that because I hadn't done my homework. There was a day, by the way, that you could rely on the fiduciary posture of your advisors, your counselors and professionals. That's what the word fiduciary means, to put your client's interests ahead of your own. And that's, the, that's the intended intent among accountants and, and lawyers and doctors. You know the idea. That's what the word fiduciary means. The Greek word for that, of course, is koinonia, interestingly enough. Today, to rely on that would be naive and hazardous. And I think, you know, I think most of you are aware of that today. Every day, the litany of non-constitutional abuses continues unabated. Every day, self-destructive policies extend their reach in our culture. Every day, it gets darker. That's what I collectively call the encroaching darkness. 
And these are just some summary extracts from some other briefings that I've given in the past. You've probably heard and some of the articles I've recently written for the personal updates. So I don't know, I'm just trying to get the flavor here as we go forward. Every day, our debts grow larger in the hundreds of millions of dollars per hour, by the way. They are already beyond any semblance of reality, and I won't take you down that path. We've talked enough about that. There is, two, at last count, there's not, not 17 trillion debt, that's cash. There's 222 trillion and growing. And that's, those are the most authoritative figures you can lay your hands on from the CBO figures. They ever say, we've got $17 million current debt. That's just the current cash debt that doesn't deal with over 200 million, trillion unfunded liabilities or Social Security, Medicaid, and other entitlement programs. You need to realize that. There's over a half a million dollars in debt for every man, woman, and child in our country. We're borrowing on the future of our great-grandchildren. You think that through. And the U.S. government continues to borrow. I think the st statistics out of date, but I'll leave it here. Four out of every ten dollars it spends is borrowed. Isn't it wonderful there's some around to lend it to them? Because that's going to end. Perhaps the most uh, famous con management consulting group is McKinsey and Company. Those of you who are in the professionals know that. The McKinsey Global Institute just issued a report which calculates the total wealth of the world is estimated at about 200 trillion. That's an interesting number to me because our debt is 10% larger than that. The debt of the United States is 10% larger than the entire wealth of the planet Earth, according to the experts. That tells you that something is out of joint. You know that's not going to be repaid ever. And that's, that implies a total regime change of some kind. And so, boy, anyway, let's move on here. I love the quote uh, from Pericles that uh, David McIlvaney used last year. It's not, we, we know it's not our job to predict the future. In fact, that's deliberately prohibited in the Torah. The prophecy was not given to predict the future. We're not there. It's, there to, it's to glorify God after it happens. So Pericles says the key is not to predict the future, but to be prepared for it. Those are different things. And we know there's a turbulent future coming. And that's part of what we talked about yesterday. That's part of what the conference is about. So it is our responsibility not to predict the future, but to prepare for the coming storms. And it doesn't take a, uh, a genius to recognize that there are turbulence coming. Not only linear effects that are against us, nonlinearities, whether it's Russia, where there's a, uh, there's a book out, uh, The Colder War, which details Putin's history, what his agenda is, and how he is winning in his race to control America, strangely enough. And we like to talk about Ezekiel 38. When you talk about Ezekiel 38, read 39, verse 6. When Magog comes again and God interve intervenes on that uh, attempted invasion of Israel, there's a third party clobbered. In verse 6, and uh, also uh, send the fire, the, the fire and uh, hailstones on, on Magog, of course, because that's the people that are funding, and on those who dwell securely in the coastlands or isles. There's a third party mentioned. Who's the third party? Well, it doesn't take much imagination. It certainly isn't Israel. That's who he's dealing, for. that's what God is dealing for. It isn't Magog. There's a third party that receives a judgment on the way. And it's a, bit a speculation, but it could be the U.S. saber rattling on behalf and then somebody does something stupid. Anyway, the encroaching darkness. Clearly, the light of freedom, we're not talking about democracy, we're talking about freedom, is quickly dimming. And you too are already heading, and this, this experts would tell you you're already there, in a police state. You may not realize it, but there are many experts that will, if you want to check that out, you'll discover we're already in the tyranny of a police state, and we're certainly under the slavery of debt. Both Washington and Wall Street are desperately trying to create the impression of a recovery. I talked about that yesterday at lunch, and, and do, uh, they insist upon measuring progress on the consumption, the CPI, consumption, uh, rather, than the, uh, rather than production. The difference between production and consumption is debt. 
and our debts are increasing. The, the, we already have too much debt, and our leadership feels that the problem is we don't have enough debt. They think the solution to having too much debt is to add more debt. That doesn't quite figure, does it? America is now the world's largest debtor, frantically printing currency, expecting that the foreign banks are foolish enough to, whoops, I'm sorry about that, are foolish enough to overlook the, ero it's eroding value, it's the greater fool theory on steroids. That's what we're dealing with. And I think I talked yesterday about the painful assessment. There was a time that God clearly blessed America. No question about that. Anyone who studies history can see that. However, we've responded to all that by outlawing him from our schools and from our public places. What's God's reaction to that? You think he's pleased with that? We allowed our kids to be taught that the creation itself was some kind of cosmic accident. You know, the ancient cultures used to attribute wonderful things to an idol of stone or whatever. We found a more insulting idol to worship. This wonderful create you can't take a leaf or a, 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 a feather from a bird instead without realizing the elegance of design that surrounds us everywhere. And yet we teach our kids there's no creator, it wasn't necessary, it all happened by chance. That's the most insulting presumption we could invent. That insults God even more so than attributing it to a false idol. You follow me? Attributing it to randomness? You've got to be That's the most insulting imagination you could do. We have shredded the fundamentals of life, marriage, fidelity, and mutual commitment. Not only in our marriages, in, in all our commitments. The sanctity of a commitment is gone, not only from our marriages, but from our business transactions. So sue me. The one where the best lawyer wins. And now we wonder why our kids have no sense of destiny. They can't even find a job. And I talk about a painful blessing. That sounds like an oxymoron, a self-contradictory phrase. Can a, how can a blessing be faith, as, uh, painful? When it punctures a delusion. And many examples of that, the simplest one I usually like to use is a five-year-old discovers in Santa Claus. By then it's important that there's a point at which he needs to understand that. Right? He can't be a liberal all his life. I'm always, I'm always in, in, intrigued with, with vocabulary. The sexual perverts and homosexuals have spawned this term gay, which is a lie. It's not a gay lifestyle. It's, it's self-shortening. But gay is the, 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 the term the press allows. But we use the, we're guilty of the same thing. We use the term liberal. The liberals aren't liberal. They're, they're, in, they're only tolerant when you agree with them. They're out, they have an agenda to separate us from our heritage. The term isn't liberal. The term is subversive. They have an agenda to separate us from our, they're welcome to do what they want to do, but they're not satisfied. They want to separate us from our heritage. That's not liberal, that has an aggressive agenda of its own. Yet we allow them the luxury of a, a metaphor that's misleading. You know, when I was in Boy Scouts, it was God and country, no problem there because you didn't have to choose between them. I graduated from the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis, and both West Point and Annapolis were things that you could take seriously. 150 years of tradition behind each one, and you had a sense of identity with America's history, one that you could be proud of. When I went back to my 50th reunion, I, was, I graduated in 50, 86, and, uh, uh, and, and it was uh, 2006, our 50th reunion, I was shocked to discover that they have gutted the academies of all the traditions. They, they straggled the class, it's just a government-sponsored college, but all the things that made it distinctive and great have been eliminated. You see, they, they, they've uh, destroyed the heritage. You can't put that back. You can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. That's a damage to the country that will never be repaired. I felt very, I suddenly began, felt that betrayal I talked about yesterday a little bit. So, so it appears that the time has come that all of us need to refocus our personal priorities, and I'm going to suggest they should be on the kingdom that's coming. 
there is a change of regime coming. And there's a king that's coming, and that's my allegiance at least. I'm not a Republican or Democrat, I'm a monarchist. And uh, we need to reprioritize our personal commitments to the coming king. And I'm asking each one of you in this room to, re to think through what that may mean for your life. To join me in that commitment, and I don't mean a commitment in some intellectual sense, I'm talking about a reprioritization of every hour of every day in those terms. And so, as I used to travel a great deal, we always had open Q&A after my speech, and there were always the most frequent questions included, where's the United States in prophecy? Anybody that studies end times realizes that all the players are well identified and we're not among them. That's provocative. And then the other question that also come up at the same time is, why hasn't God judged America? Anybody with spiritual insight realizes that's overdue. Billy Graham quipped that decades ago when he said, if God doesn't judge America, you have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's a great soundbite. And he pulled off, and it's very vivid, and it's certainly true, more true today than ever. That's not a new idea, that was not a new idea with Billy Graham. Thomas Jefferson said the same thing back in 1781. He said, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. Now that all, I personally believe, can't, that not everybody agrees with me, the people you have in KI have all, and the speakers have different points of view and we welcome that because that's healthy. So when I make, express a personal view, that doesn't mean anything but it's my own personal point of view. I believe the shield of God, which previously sheltered us from an overdue judgment, has now been removed. I think his abandonment wrath has be already begun. Now why do I feel that? See, for decades, I used to rely on Genesis 12, 2, and 3 to answer that question, why hasn't God judged America? And I used to lean on Genesis chapter uh, 12, 2, and 3. That, uh, you know, because where, where Abraham is promised, I'll bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee. And I used to use our support of Israel as our protection, our shielding of over to judgment. But now in the first time in America's history, America's turned his back on the plight of Israel. As a, our official position as a nation is against Israel. Even in the past when we support it, we did it clumsily and there were some, there were some betrayals, but our official position was one of standing for Israel's right to exist. And uh, now we even have a Sunni Muslim in the White House? You've got to be kidding. And I won't get into all that. You know more about it. You, know more, you probably want to know about that. There are several wraths of God if you study your scripture. There's appositional wrath. He's always against sin, obviously. There's catastrophical wrath. The flood of Noah is one example of that. There's eschatological wrath. Revelation 6. Let me get that little arrow off the way here. Um, Revelation 6 to 19 is a well-known example of eschatological wrath. But the one I see most frequently used throughout the scripture is what I call the abandonment wrath of God. And that's, that's what Samson did, the last visit with Delilah, when he was stamped, and he expected to be able to break through, and he couldn't. And in that instant, he realized something I'm sure must have terrified him, when he realized God's hand had been removed. He no longer could break loose from those bonds. Same thing happened in the Northern Kingdom. They went to idol worship, so God recruits Hosea from the southern kingdom to go there and present his indictment of the kingdom. And from Hosea chapter 4 through 14 is the layout. It's not a preachment to repent or else this will happen. No, no, no. It's laying out what's going to happen because. And it's summarized in a simple verse. As far as Ephraim is concerned, leave him alone. He's joined to idols. That summarizes the flavor of those ten chapters. And, and, and that, what God did is just took his protective hand away and let the Assyrians remove them from history, which he did. And uh, that's where we get the famous uh, Isaiah 9:10, bricks replaced with hewn stones, sycamores. That whole judgment derives as part of that picture. The southern kingdom, 100 years later, the southern kingdom is in the same predicament. And Habakkuk is really upset because he realized how far Israel has fallen, or I should say Judah has fallen, and uh, 
And God does, tells him, boy, what's coming you won't believe, even though I've told you. He's talking about a judgment that's coming, where God uses the Babylonians, in this case, to be his instrument of judgment on the southern kingdom. So, now, we all misquote this verse that Habakkuk gets from God. Behold ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work, God speaking, I will work a work in your days, which ye will not believe though it be told you. We quote, we often are guilty of quoting that out of context. The context is he, God's describing to Habakkuk, there's a judgment coming you won't believe, even though I tell you. And uh, so, so you work through this, and you get to verse 4. One of the most fascinating verses in the Old Testament is one if you're just reading, you might miss. Speaking here, behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. And that is a little phrase that would disappear into obscurity, except it becomes the key phrase by the Apostle Paul for three of his epistles. The just shall live by his faith. The just shall live by faith. Who are the just? Paul answers that with the epistle of the Romans. And in Romans chapter 1 verse 17, he quotes Habakkuk 2, 4, and builds his whole epistle on explaining justification. Who are the just? That's pretty cool. You get to, uh, the just shall what? How shall the just live? By works? No, no, no. Paul writes the epistle to the Galatians, and right in the middle of that, chapter 3 verse 17, he quotes Habakkuk 2, 4, to explain the idea of grace, not works. Praise God for that. The just shall live by what? By faith. What do you mean by faith? He writes the epistle to the Hebrews. In just in chapter 10, verse 38, just a verse or two before the famous hall of faith, we call it, chapter 11, he had in, so he this explains that. So we, and that's just before chapter 11. So these three epistles, Romans, Galatians, and Hebrew, turn out to be a trilogy expanding and explaining what Habakkuk 2.4 means. Why am I spending this time on this? Because this is our mandate for today. Things are going to be coming down the road that are going to shock us of all kinds. Not just in the U.S., globally, but we're focusing, of course, provincially on our own country. And we're being challenged by the Holy Spirit to be ready for the just shall live by what? By faith. And God is going to find a new way every day to ask you the same question. Do you trust him? That's what you... And by the way, if you want to see the, the most graphic example of that is in a new book that's out there written by my wife. And I say that not because she wrote it, because I'm startled with its clarity and its depth, personally. When I first, I got a chance to read the PDFs and stuff before she went to press, and I skimmed them. It wasn't until I actually had that in my hand and read it carefully, I was stunned at its depth, its transparency, and its relevance. So I encourage you, there are a number of books out here you don't want to leave without. You don't want to leave, leave here without <laughs> Bob Cornuke's The Temple, because that's, that's got so many Jews upset, that's worth it just to see that, stir that pot. <laughs> Nan's book, Hope Against Hope, will give you an insight in hope versus faith, the differences and what they mean, that is, to me, the most illuminating thing I've read in, in many, many years. So I'll mention that in passing. And of course, in deference to my partner, I have to point out to I, Jesus, as an example. I'll allude that here in a minute, too, anyway. But this trilogy is for today, is my point. And there's a litmus test. Are, has God's abandonment wrath started. Different experts will have different opinions about that. And it's a big debate. I believe God's abandonment and wrath has begun. Why do I say that? Because I made a discovery personally not long ago. I discovered Paul has given us a litmus test which will, will reveal our status where we are, interestingly enough. It turns out when I did my re refresh of Genesis, the Genesis commentary, I was startled to discover something I didn't fully realize before. God has many jealousies, but his number one jealousy is not his Redeemer. That takes the Word of God to bring that forward. His number one jealousy is as Creator, because the creation itself leaves us without excuse. 
So his number one jealousy is as creator. Now, I discovered God has a specific judgment on any culture that fails to acknowledge him as a creator. I never realized that before. I taught Romans chapter 1 from verse 18 to the end again in many, many years because I presumed it was talking about homosexuality. And uh, that's the way I read it, that's the way I understood it. I didn't realize what it was actually saying was a little deeper than I had appreciated previously. And so, see what I get there. Three times in the last half of the book of Romans, it's God who, quote, gives them over to that which is not convenient. I never realized what it's really talking about. It isn't an indictment of homosexuality. There's plenty of that in Leviticus and elsewhere. That's not the point. For a culture that denies God as a creator, he will give them as a culture over to that which is not convenient. And three times in that passage, that's essentially his point. That the prevalence of homosexuality in a culture is a judgment of God to that culture which fails to acknowledge him as a creator. So the question is, gee, has God's abandonment wrath started yet? I suggest you pick up any newspaper any day and come to your own conclusions. The homosexuals have a lobby that's second to none. Well, I can't get into this topic, though, without acknowledging a reality I don't want to be guilty of ignoring. And that's 2 Chronicles 7.14. I've preached on this for many years. Are you all familiar with it? And uh, it's, it, it, if we're... God gives Solomon, he appears to Solomon, that's interesting, and he, he announces to Solomon a principle. He says, if my people, who are called by my name, shall humble themselves, and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal the land. If they will do four things, I'll do three. If they will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, well, we, we, humble, we know how to, well, the most humble man here raise their hand. <laughs> okay. I couldn't resist a little facetious. My, I believe in the spiritual gifts. Mine is flippancy. I'm sorry. <laughs> if my people who are called by my, notice who this is addressed to. Okay. If they will humble themselves, pray, and seek my, and here, it's the fourth one. Because <laughs> we know how to humble ourselves. We may not do it enough, but we know what that means. And we know how to pray. We don't do it enough, but we know how to do that and seek my face. That's a commitment thing, not an intellectual thing. And turn from their wicked ways. That's where we stumble. Because I want you to notice who this is addressed to. It's not addressed to the entertainment industry in Hollywood. It's not addressed to the executives in the corridors of power. No, no, no. If my people who are called by my name. Now, that, I sometimes used to joke to audiences and say, you're probably the best undercover Christians that people have ever seen because your neighbors never suspect you're sold out to Christ. And I'm being, I hope I'm being facetious here. Now, if my people who are called by my name will turn from their wicked ways, notice who this is addressed to. It shocked me way, way back to realize it's the sin in the body of Christ that's in the way of God doing what he's trying to do. Then God says he will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, apparently not until then, and will heal their land. So I wanted to go on record before I go on further. I never want to stand in the way where repentance is a path to our redemption. But I have to tell you candidly and just candor with you, I don't see a spirit of redemption, of, of uh, repentance within the body. I see it here and there. Praise God for that. Don't misunderstand me. But I don't think I could honestly represent to you, collectively, there's an atmosphere of repentance within the ecclesia in America. I hope I'm wrong. Nothing would please me more in the coming months to find out, gee, well, boy, was I wrong there back in October. But what I really want to focus on, having said all that as a warm-up, I want to share with you two things. Something that's obvious and something that may come as a surprise. But I want you to leave this conference with your personal action plan. And you need to come to terms with that yourself. And your channel, I usually always put this on the screen to make a point. And I'm going to put something on the screen that's preposterous. I believe it sincerely, but don't, don't accept it. If you accept what I put on the screen, you flunk the chorus. I want you to challenge, and I think your presence here does that very thing. I want you to challenge these things. 
that you and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee that climbed, or climbed the mountain of Judea. Now this, that's preposterous, that we are moving into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about the gospel period. That's preposterous. I hope you think so, because I want you to challenge that. Okay? And by the way, you just heard an incredible presentation that does that very thing. There's things about uh, Egypt I think most of us had never picked up on, thanks to our friend Joseph. I'm so glad he's a member of our family here. But the question, how do you, how do you challenge this thing? You've got to do two things. You first of all got to find out what the Bible really says. Not what Chuck Missler says, or whomever. That, no, you have to find out yourself what it says. You can't delegate that to others. Now fortunately in this uh, environment we live in today, there are tools, and I forgot to bring a couple of mine, I think. There are all kinds of tools that we have that are fantastic. You can carry a credit card in your body that has all the teachings of Matthew and Genesis in English, Mandarin, German, Roman, whatever. And the, the tools we have, and I don't mean just this, you, many of us have more Bibles in our phone than we used to own at home. Okay, and, it's, and the word searchable. So the, we have a unique environment. Never before in the history of man has the Word of God been more available everywhere. The advanced information appliances and the internet, for heaven's sakes, do you realize that all of man's knowledge is a couple clicks away if you know how to use it? That's fantastic. You can accomplish more in 10 minutes than scholars used to be able to do in six weeks. Because it's right there all, it's just incredible. But the other thing that's now well understood is the role of small groups. And I take a small group as 11 or less. It starts getting 12 or more, it starts to get, needs to be divided probably. But a small group, not just a small group, but that's committed to the exposition of the Word of God. Weekly, during the week. You can't grow with a 45 minutes message on Sunday morning. It's not enough. Being in a group that's small enough where people can ask questions without embarrassment. A small enough group that there's a sense of accountability. And, and uh, if you're not in a small group, repent. <laughs> and if you can't find one, start one. You do not have to be a teacher to, start, to, to lead a small group. You can put a, a well-chosen DVD in the thing and play it and then talk about it. And just have someone there to keep you there to police it and make sure that one person doesn't dominate. But you, you can lead a group without teaching it. There's plenty of good teaching around if you can harness to the service of a small group. So there's, there's a whole thing, you, there's groups as you know to get into that. But that's just part one. Find out what the Bible says. Part two is not so simple. And that's find out what's really going on. And uh, what is truth, Pilate asked so famously. That's the trick to understand. And that's when I praise God for World Net Daily. WND is an example. Not the only one, but one of the leading ones. But find out the resources that you have. We do live in the age of deceit, and one of the tools we hope to instill in our programs is to get people to discern what's real and what's not. Because we live, we, that's what the Issachar Avenue is all about. To cut through the baloney and find out what's, because everything's biased, at least sometimes deliberately. Your trick is to find out what's really going on. And that takes a whole different set of skills than the, the Berean Avenue. You know it's true, the challenge is to understand it. There's a set of tools to help you. In the Issachar Avenue of study, it's just the opposite. Those tools and resources are antithetical. And that's a whole different family of resources you need to learn how to use. But I want to mention that one of the remedies here, if you haven't discovered the book called The Pilgrim Church, you'll discover that throughout the history since Pentecost, small groups of Bible believers have been struggling to remain faithful to the Word of God, but they all have been oppressed and persecuted, not by the local, not by the government, the national or imperial government, that's the one we always know about, no, no, by the local churches. And to really get into that, you want to discover E.H. Uh, uh, e. uh, Broadbent's book, The Pilgrim Church. But anyway, setting that aside for the moment, even if all established institutions become prostituted to serve the siren calls of social injustice, and there'll be plenty of those, 
there still remains a powerful alternative, and I'm going to get into that a little bit. I'm going to now admonish you three, in fact, four. Doesn't that sound biblical? How often it's three, but really four, or six, but really seven. You know, you've seen that term. Well, I'm going to do the same thing to you. There's three basic steps we've talked about, and I'm going to surprise you with a fourth to add to that as we go here. Three are familiar, but the fourth may be a surprise. What's the remedy? Step one. Get serious about your personal commitment to the coming king. Well, I've accepted Christ. Praise God. But are you really serious about that commitment? Jesus is not a concept, a worthwhile tradition, a comfortable compromise in a sea of alternatives. Well, most everyone here has outgrown that naive day. And this is where I resisted the temptation to put a little snapshot of I, Jesus, in here, because that's one of the reasons that we published that. Jesus is alive. He'll soon be coming to take his throne with an appointment that was established before the foundation of the world. The one thing every one of you in this room needs to understand is the reality of a living Lord who has a yearning. You know, it shocked me to come to terms with the fact that, that Jesus has a yearning. He, he created the place in the first place, and yet he has a yearning. That yearning is for us to be with him. He discusses that with his father in John 17. That fascinates me, that he can have a yearn, an unfulfilled yearning, yet to be fulfilled. Okay, that's step one. Step two, if you take Jesus seriously, your next step has to be to repair your biblical illiteracy. K.I. was really formed to repair biblical illiteracy not only within the body of Christ, but within the pulpits. It's astonishing, and most, most pastors will be very candid about this, that they have a way to go to repair their biblical literacy. And that's one of the things we're trying to build resources to repair. How are you going to get into a weekly study group committed to the exposition of that supernatural book that may be gathering dust on your shelves? Be in it every week with a group that is faithful and follows through verse by verse, for a book at a time, whatever. So, that's step two. Step three, now I'm going to go if you're really serious. You're, you see, I've done that. I believe it. I'm, I'm with you so far, Chuck. Great. Praise God. If you're really serious, commit yourself to an aggressive spiritual growth program with others that are like-minded. It doesn't have to be ours, but get into a systematic program to carry you through a program of study. There are many around many different shapes and sizes. We have one that we push, but that's not my point here. Get into a, a uh, progressive program. Now, the Internet has now made all of man's knowledge only a few clicks away. So your resources in undertaking a serious spiritual growth has resources. And among the spiritual resources now available, they're life-changing. I think this thing going forward creates a whole different type of ministry that I suspect, I don't know, I suspect may be the most powerful response to the encroaching darkness that we're all going to experience is to go underground. And so, so again, we have the Berean, Issachar, and the Koinos, but I'm pushing on your tactical priorities. Tactical priorities. In the Berean and Issachar and Koinos, in Berean, systematic study of the Word. Commit yourself to it and let, let nothing interfere with that. Issachar, repair the deceits. Find, do your homework so you don't get conned by the nonsense that's coming out of Washington or Wall Street. And thirdly, create your own action plan. There is a cosmic war going on, and it's approaching a climax. And whatever you decide, you have a significant destiny emerging within the coming turmoil. There's going to be turmoil coming, the likes of which we don't have the capacity to to second guess, but it's coming. And you'll have a destiny in that turmoil. And so I'm suggesting with an extreme sense of urgency, you study, you assess yourself, and prepare for the encroaching storm. And pray intensely about your ministry. Find out what God is calling you to do and get prepared for it. Pray for discernment and pray for resolve. Let's do our closing word of prayer. Father, we thank you for who you are. 
We do pray, Father, that through your word and through your Holy Spirit, you would help each of us in this room discover what you would desire as our calling. Help us, Father, to discover that. Help us to appropriate it. Give us the discernment, the wisdom, and the resolve to be a blessing to you, Father, as we commit ourselves, every one of us, without any reservations or conditions. We commit ourselves into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, HaMashiach, the, the Lord Jesus, our Messiah, our coming King, indeed. Amen. Thank you. Okay, buddy. There is, of course, no substitute for Chuck Messler. I know you're all, all exhausted, but what we're going to ask you to do is stand up, stretch, and we're going to continue on our schedule. But just one more time, show Chuck how much we love him.